Now, do you feel yourself British or Canadian or American? Because you've lived in the United States, you've lived in Canada. You lived I in think I'm very uh, insular, uh, initially very uh, native-born Englishman. And I don't think I, I export very well my, as a personality. But I've learned to love Canada and to love the States. And I've really sort of grown out of that now. But when I started, I was, you know, I was very, I was a POW for five years during the war. And uh, first time I went to Paris was on my honeymoon. I hadn't traveled in Europe much. I'd been in Germany before the war, but, but I never enjoyed travel. But I've done a lot since, you know, I've been in Australia and all over. You know, I feel very close to Canada because Canada nursed me through my infancy as a growing director. I mean, it, it was a fantastically generous thing to happen to me. And I feel very generous towards Stratford in, in return. But uh, it took me three seasons to begin to know how to use that stage. And until... Now, you first came with Guthrie and assisted, did you not? I came and did Julius Caesar with a cast that was not of my choosing, with Lorne Green as Brutus and Lloyd Bochner as Cassius and Donald Davis as Mark Antony. Uh, and I mean, I, I was given a, a crowd of 80 uh, students to be the, the bulk of the forum scene, so we could have lots of fun running up and down the aisles in, the, in that scene that you know so well. <laughs> and, uh, but it, 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 was, it was not total disaster. In fact, it was, Guthrie said, if you take this on, and uh, I, we didn't want to come as a family. If you take this on and you don't fall totally on your face for the first production you do, I'm going to recommend you to the board to take over from me. And so I How thought... How did you deal with that pressure? I, everything was pressure. I was unhappy. I mean, I knew, I, knew I, was not, I didn't feel easy about anything. I didn't feel easy about my family. And I was just sort of out of sorts for a, a not very good company, even for myself because I was at odds with things. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's nothing like a bit of confidence to make you feel better. But I could only get confidence during those three years by doing something in Britain, which was well received. And I think, well, I'm not that awful. I really have got some talent. But it, and then my familiarity with the stage and finding out how to use it, and then finding out how I could use it and meld it to my own needs. That was such a joyful discovery and although I'd been told by the production manager early on in these years, these early years, that I was unpopular, and I didn't care about being unpopular, the, the thing had been a miraculous birth, and uh, here was someone new coming in, and there was no knowing whether that birth had been a fluke. Uh, no one in Canada believed it was important until the day the New York Times said it was important. Such was the confidence in Canadian theatre. Uh, but uh, I, I wasn't concerned with, with the popularity. I was concerned with just gritting my teeth and making it work. It's got to work. It can't fail. We've got to this man's trusted me to do this. I've got to do it for him. And uh, that gradually uh, wore off. And, we, and I began to break through. And everything started to, you know, to make more money and to resolve itself. How did it wear off, though, in the way people talk to you, or the actors, or the ticket numbers? Well, my own or? confidence uh, in, in myself and so on, I think, made me a much more approachable person than when I didn't know what I was, <laughs> was doing. And uh, the, my joy in working with the actors, my getting to know the actors and them getting to know me, and that becoming a, a relaxed relationship. I think that was largely it. And the fact that we were beginning to have fun with everything. Everything was a uh, sort of, you can't. When Tony believed in the play way. You know, if you don't make it a game, maybe he used to carry that perhaps a little bit far sometimes. But uh, uh, th that sort of thing crept into the work we were doing. And but let's talk about confidence for a little bit. Because at the center of the creative process is confidence. And so many artists and so many artists such as yourself, who's had an extraordinary career, it's surprising to hear the, the, the recognition of non-confidence at, at parts of your career. And 
So how, how an artist overcomes that kind of, that hole at the center I, I think it's just to do something else that, that you could feel confidence in. I mean, just anything, just writing a letter or, just, or any conversation with someone. It's little things. It's little things that accumulate to make you feel okay. But if you're, if you're lacking confidence as a director, uh, I had very good people to help me. I had great uh, uh, friendships with uh, Tanya Mazevich, later with Desmond Healy, later with Leslie Harry, you know, designers. Uh, and I talked, about, I talked with them about my feelings and so on. So I wasn't alone. Perhaps I'm making too much of it. Perhaps I'm making it sound worse than it was. No, but it's important because artists have to understand this, this virus of non-confidence and how it eats all of us. And yet, uh, very successful people like yourselves overcome it. I think I overcame it by virtue of sharing what I felt about a play, just in discussing it, how I thought we should do it, what it meant and everything, with someone that I really respected and finding that they agree. Well, that would happen with designers uh, and with assistant directors and uh, actors too. And uh, it, it was just, a, a, I just think that my confidence grew from learning more, from learning my job. I did hear a wonderful phrase, nothing has more confidence than no talent. That's <laughs> helped me through many a dark hole. No, that's a good one. I've never heard that before. <laughs> Nothing has more confidence than no talent. Yes. And I, I'm s astounded at the utterly talented people yeah. who have had pools of despair and non I mean, I'm frightened. I've, I've been frightened so, you know, regularly. You're frightened that you're, you're going to make an absolutely shameful mess of something. I mean, three days ago, I thought I was going to. I just opened it with a play, a play, a, an evening about the sonnets. And we were so under rehearsed, we hadn't had enough time. The guy who's uh, uh, Simon Callow is playing the parts, marvelous man, marvelous actor, marvelous mind. Uh, I thought he'd turn up line perfect. That was the plan. He didn't. So we spent half the time we rehearsing, learning line. So you can't direct a play, and if you, you know, lose that, we'll catch up with ourselves. I think it's an interesting, very interesting show. But it's interesting, here we are talking about Shakespeare. Uh, 444 years since he was born. And in the sonnets, she does expect to be immortal for 500 years. He, he, he goes as far as that. I, I guess it, I mean, not he being immortal, it's his works being immortal. But uh, I should think when he started, he did think there was a chance of, of immortality for the works. They'd stay on maybe till the end of the 17th century. But 500 years is a fantastic claim. And he's almost made it. I mean, we're only six years. And did he write sonnets his entire life? No, no, it was a, it was a craze, Elizabethan craze, sort of 97, I think it starts into the early 1600s. So he was, what, in his early 30s when he stopped writing sonnets? I think he was for 40, in his oh. 40s. I think, he, yes, he felt he was old and ugly and, you know, a, a vagabond because he was an actor. Being a poet was okay, but being an actor was the pits. And he felt. Why is that? What is that about? It's just the truth. They were, they were, you know, all kinds of laws were forbidden them because they were vagabonds. That was the reputation of the actor. I think it changed somewhat during his life. It certainly changed in the following century. But you could say that the, Brit the Britney Spears are the vagabonds of today, but on a very different level. You know, the, the starlets in Hollywood who live these uh, yeah. disastrously drug and No, it's all changed because in Britain we started knighting them and making them dames and that. That's, it's all completely changed. It, 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 society's differently built. But at that time, he was aware of being uh, a vagabond. And he just wanted to make himself into a gentleman somehow. And he was, you know, got enough money to build that house in Stratford on Avon uh, and to. Um, improve his status. His father was pretty active in the same, on the same course. And, uh, Do you think his writing changed as he became more successful? I think it grew. I think it was a, 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 gro a growing process. Oh, yes. Uh, 
I mean, there's nothing in, in, in the world to equal it. I mean, no matter what, you, what trans language you translate him into, mm -hmm. he is the outstanding figure, and he's a great... I mean, to, to be associated with him for most of my life <coughs> is a incre an incredible privilege. And uh, it just so happens that I was born at a time when there was more happening in the way of rediscovering Shakespeare than through any century since he wrote. The 20th century, it was born with, uh, with Powell uh, at the beginning of the century, carried Granville Barker, Guthrie, Peter Brook, uh, um, Peter Hall. I mean, all this was a very, very important, and I was in it, I was there part of it, and that was just chance. Um, and uh, Stratford was there in the middle of it, and that was just chance. Stratford happened in the 50s, because Guthrie had, the, I guess, the essence of Stratford, which was new in, rediscover, in rediscovery of Shakespeare only insofar as the staging was concerned, nothing to do with the speech, nothing to do with other aspects. But he had done a production of Hamlet. Are you talking Stratford on Avon or Stratford, Canada? Stratford, Canada. Stratford, Canada. Uh, he, he'd done a production of Stratford for the Old Vic, and it went on tour with Alec Guinness playing uh, Hamlet to uh, Elsinore, to, to the, and it was a rainy night in Elsinore where I think the essence of Stratford was born because they couldn't play uh, in the air, it was uh, too wet. They had a lot of people invited to this and they, and they, and they said, please uh, do it in the, in, the ball, in the ballroom of the hotel. Well, they couldn't get the audience in, there were too many of them at one end, so they had to put them around the sides. So then they had to improvise, playing what they'd rehearsed with an audience on three sides of them. The first time Guthrie had known that, of course he couldn't do much about it, but he, it, it, it attracted his attention. He went from there to the assembly halls in Edinburgh, where you had a three-sided auditorium, and then he gets a call from someone in Canada to say, could you come and start something here? We want to build something. I think that Tom Patterson thought that the band shell would probably be okay to start with. But, but anyway, <laughs> Tony said he'd come, you know, after weird telephones to him in the backwoods of, uh, where was he, Mon County Monaghan. <laughs> he agreed to come if he'd, they'd pay the fare. <laughs> and so he came and, uh, well, you know how it happened. Well, a monstrous <coughs> tent and the rainstorms and... Alec Guinness being in a tent in a town that didn't quite know what to make of it, in a country that wasn't they, ready. They yet. just knew, knew they weren't meant to mow the lawn during a performance. <laughs> <laughs> the tent was so... And of course, in Henry V, we had the trouble with trains. They see, the big train from Toronto always arrived during, the, arrived during the very quiet soliloquy before the Battle of Agincourt is joined. And uh, we got in touch with them about this. Could they help? And they, they, they agreed. That this is fantastic, you know, a community mm. helping out a thing like the Stratford Festival, just that. Uh, and they would hold the, hold the plane, uh, train up in Shakespeare, the next station, until we said the soliloquy was over because the battle was joined and they will be able to have the noise of the train then. And that was just, you know, special. That's theatre. Yeah, that's right.